Hi everyone, thank you for joining us to our webinar, Full Stack Control in the Microservices World. I'm Maya, I'm the Marketing Manager here at Spotinst, and I'm super excited to be hosting this with uh, our great partners AWS and Epsagon. Our speakers for today will be Ron Scheinberg, Specialist Solutions Architect from AWS, Sachi Duek, CTO Architect from Spotinst, and uh, Ron Ribbenzaft, Co-Founder and CTO of Epsagon. Let's quickly go over the agenda. Um, so we'll start with an overview of uh, EKS versus non-managed Kubernetes solutions, then how to simplify infrastructure management for ECS EKS workloads while reducing cost by up to 90%, and we'll finish with tracing and monitoring microservices on ECS and EKS. Ran, let's start. Over to you. Thank you, Maya. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. I'd like to talk to you today about the Amazon EKS design principles and what makes EKS a great choice for running Kubernetes-based workloads in the cloud. There's a lot of customers running Kubernetes clusters on AWS, and there are many ways to do that. Uh, customers could be using KOps, Kube ADM, Kube AWS, Kube Spray, or you could be writing your own tooling with CloudFormation or Terraform, but really you'll be on your own if you have a problem problem with etcd, for example, if you need to take care of scaling your control plane, troubleshooting, upgrading, and maintaining it. Um, and that involves some undifferentiated heavy lifting where you're not, you're not focusing on your, on your application, but you're focusing on operations. Uh, the AWS Kubernetes, Kubernetes team's mission is to make AWS the best place to run Kubernetes workloads. And one of the goals is to remove this undifferentiated heavy lifting, making, making it easier for you to run your application applications and optimize your applications for production uh, scale and performance, as well as resilience, high availability, um, and cost optimization as well. Let's go over some of these design principles. Before we do that, uh, let's have a quick recap of how an Amazon EKS cluster looks like in terms of the architecture. So the control plane consists of at least two API server nodes and three etcd nodes for the quorum, and these run across three availability zones within a region. EKS leverages the architecture of AWS regions in a well-architected way in order to maintain high availability. And because EKS does that, it's able to offer an SLA for the endpoint, uh, for the API server endpoint availability. Uh, what we see at the bottom is the customer's managed VPC where you are in, in charge of running um, your worker nodes, which would be EC2 instances uh, that can be on-demand, reserved instances, savings plan instances, uh, and of course, uh, spot instances. The first design principle is that EKS is built to support production workloads for, from day one for any size customer, whether you're a startup or a large enterprise workload. Uh, if you have hundreds or thousands of developers, you just start a cluster and it works. There's an SLA of 99.99% uh, uh, for the Kubernetes cluster endpoint. And of course, AWS is really experienced with running large scale uh, production workloads um, and AKS takes advantage of all those learnings and operational excellence. AKS runs Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes control plane instances across the availability zones, as we mentioned, in order to ensure the high availability. And it automatically detects and replaces unhealthy control plane instances, uh, provides automatic version upgrades and patching for those instances. So that's one thing you don't need to focus on uh, when, you use, when you use Amazon EKS and we take care of um, the availability, performance, and resilience of your um, API endpoint and your entire uh, control plane, essentially. The second design principle is that EKS is native and upstream, and that means that tooling and upstream APIs work seamlessly with EKS. Uh, and the reason that we're committed to running upstream EKS is we know that our customers tell us that they need the ecosystem, the extensibility model, they want to write their custom controllers, all the great stuff about Kubernetes that just works on EKS because it is vanilla Kubernetes. And as a result, what we're seeing is customers running a huge variety of community Community-driven workloads using EKS, whether they're uh, training their ML workloads on Kubeflow, using Prometheus for monitoring, running ELK stacks, uh, running their CI/CD workload with Jenkins or any other CI/CD tools, everything just works on EKS because it is upstream and native to Kubernetes. 
And being upstream means being good community citizens for the Kubernetes community uh, and doing things that make Kubernetes better overall on AWS or anywhere you choose to run it. Um, a part of being native and upstream means that you can run those uh, Kubernetes applications in and out of AWS, whether it's on-prem or another cloud. Uh, everything can be migrated in and out because, uh, because EKS is just running vanilla Kubernetes. Um, you can run it anywhere, uh, w whether it's your office on a Raspberry Pi or another cloud. Um, and generally, the API uh, will, and behavior will be the same. And the Kubernetes team contributes time with bug fixes, security patching, tooling improvements, uh, listening to customers and refining those open source projects in order to improve uh, the experience and being good community c uh, citizens uh, in the open source community for Kubernetes. And this communication can be seen if you go to the containers roadmap project on the on uh, on on GitHub, where you can see some of the future uh, features and services um, that are being built for the container um, uh, services ecosystem on on AWS. And here you can see actually the product managers and developers uh, discussing some of those features with the Kubernetes community. Uh, so if you're interested in any feature or or you have something that you're waiting for, uh, I suggest going to the containers roadmap in the URL that you have on your screen right now and having a look um, and, uh, at, at the features that you're interested in. And the last design principle really is that um, you also get all the power of AWS infrastructure with integrations like storage, monitoring, logging, networking, routing, and ingress. It's uh, it's very important for us to for customers to run their Kubernetes uh, workloads on AWS, but also unleash the full breadth and depth of the AWS platform uh, by using all those different services and features uh, that we have in in the AWS cloud. So um, we're build, we're giving you all those building blocks, and you can use them to build. Um, you know, those super well-architected, resilient, cost-efficient workloads on AWS. And Amazon EKS is, is um, deeply integrated with all those, uh, with all the other parts of the AWS ecosystem. So this is kind of a logical overview of how your usage of EKS would look like. And normally, if you're running outside of EKS, you'd have your API endpoint. Uh, with EKS, what you see at the top of your screen is the regional EKS service endpoint. And this is the place where your uh, cluster administrator, this could be yourself in, in some of those cases, would provision man and manage the, the EKS clusters. And, and after you talk to that EKS uh, endpoint and, for example, create a cluster, this would create a Kubernetes cluster for you, whereas later on, um, your developers or your automations, whether you're using GitOps or other any other CACD option, would just communicate to the Kubernetes API server endpoint, whether this is using kubectl or anything else, in order to deploy your applications. And from there, you just have a native Kubernetes cluster, which is being uh, maintained and operated by, by EKS, taking away all the heavy lifting of the control plane. If you want to learn more and get started with EKS, uh, you can go to the EKS website on the AWS uh, uh, site itself. Uh, the easiest way to get started with EKS is to use the, the official EKS CTL command line. This is a joint project by Weaveworks and AWS, where you just download this tool and in a single CLI command, you can get your EKS cluster up and running. And if you got, want to get hands-on uh, experience with running EKS and deploying different applications, um, running different workloads on an EKS cluster, you can uh, use the labs at eksworkshop.com. Uh, thank you for your time. And from here, I'll hand it over to Tzachi. Thank you, Ran. Your presentation was insightful as always. My name is Tzachi Dweck, and I'm an architect at the office of the CTO at Spartans. And today we're going to talk about how to make Kubernetes infrastructure management easier and efficient. Before that, a few words about Spartans. Uh, we were founded five years ago and with our compelling value offering, we have grown to over 170 employees in five offices worldwide. And most significantly, we have over 1,000 paying and much satisfied customers. 
I would like to start with a short brief of the Spotins journey. At Spotins, we look at our offering in three-dimensional space, providing solution for different use cases, offering a variety of values on the different provider services. At the beginning, we were focusing on running web workloads on AWS Cloud, providing cost optimization and automation. As the world of cloud and DevOps evolved, we supported more cloud providers such as Google and Azure, providing simplification and visibility across additional use cases such as containers, big data, machine learning, and much more. In today's webinar, I will be focused on our solution for containers, Docker, ECS, and of course, Kubernetes. But before we dive into what Spot is providing the containers area, let's cover some of the key challenges with managing Kubernetes infrastructure. So first, we need to think about scaling which metric we should use, how to handle scaling events, monitoring containers in terms of requirement, restriction, and healthiness of the actual pod, how to handle spiky workload, meaning eliminating the time needed for a new instance to be lodged and to be registered to the cluster, leveraging spot instances to reduce costs, which spot market has the greatest savings, which has the greatest durability, and how many interruption I can expect from a single spot market. Regarding instance sizes, we need to choose the right instance size to match the pod's requirements and how to create a healthy blend of instance type and sizes. With that, we need to think of overcapacity, meaning launching two big instances, or undercapacity, launching two small instances over and over again. Taking into consideration pod restrictions such as node affinity or node selectors and how to support multiple LAN specification such as specific modification of the worker node like custom user data, launching instances in a specific availability zones and much more. And finally, how we can assess costs for Kubernetes services while those are actually spread across pods on multiple instances. In order to address all of those challenges, we created a product called Ocean. Ocean is built to do all the heavy lifting of Kubernetes infrastructure cluster management, so customers can focus on more important activities which are relevant to their business needs. With our unique out of scaler, Ocean takes into consideration all of the containers requirements and, rest and restrictions and scales with the most suitable spot instance type and size to guarantee high availability, cost reduction, and efficient usage of all resources. Using Ocean, meaning you get to work in the actual application on containers while we handle the details of cluster infrastructure management and also providing up to 90% cost savings. Ocean can integrate with any container platform, whether it's EKS, GKE, AKS, do it yourself Kubernetes, Docker, and of course, ECS. Ocean intelligently chooses which instance types and size should be launched according to the container's requirement. Again, Ocean continuously monitors your cluster, verifying that all pods are running on the most efficient and healthy infrastructure. If nodes are unhealthy for some reason, Ocean will automatically replace it, ensuring availability and efficiency. Regarding automatically scale down, Ocean runs what we call pod rescheduling simulation in which it tries to identify which nodes can be drained while their pods can be rescheduled elsewhere in the cluster while taking all of the requirements and restrictions. Another important Ocean feature, which helps our ensure high availability, is what we call the headroom. A headroom is a specific amount of CPU and memory that a customer wants to keep available at the cluster at any given time. This can be very useful for a spiky workload in which you the customer will want to save the time needed for an instance to be launched and to be registered to the cluster. Ocean also provides a cost management visibility for the application by analyzing costs for every pod that was running on the cluster, aggregated to the Kubernetes resources, either deployments or stateful set. This provides full cost visibility for your application. With this, our customers can easily do chargeback and other cost allocation exercise to find out specifically how much each application or team is costing them. 
Another great capability is the right sizing recommendation. Ocean Monitor, the actual usage of CPU and memory of your containers and compare it to the resource request definition. Based on this data-driven approach, our customers can update and right-size their containers resource requests for optimal utilization of resources. With this, you can get additional savings by choosing the right size resource request for your pods and containers. And now we move to the demo part. So let's start by reviewing the Spotting console. Uh, so this is the Ocean product. Uh, it's connected to my EKS cluster. I can get information about how much CPU allocation and memory allocation I have in this cluster, what is the Kubernetes version, which provision to well, use to uh, launch this cluster, how much I saved this month in terms of uh, running on spot instances, how many connected nodes. And as you can see, it's currently because it's my testing environment, uh, I only have one node. It holds 18 pods and allocates 50% of the CPU of this cluster. I would like to start and demonstrate how the autoscaler works and how it reacts to different uh, uh, deployment. So just to make sure I'm working on the same node just for you to see, this is 128-26. So let's do a uh, kubectl get node command. And this is the node I'm working on. Great. Uh, moving forward, uh, I've created the predefined uh, uh, YAMLs for uh, deployments to illustrate how uh, the autoscale will work. So we'll start with what uh, uh, I call big pod. And big pod is a regular prod. It just has request of amount of CPU memory, four gig of memory and four vCPUs, uh, which is quite large and I don't have enough room in the cluster. Uh, what I would be able to see when I will uh, apply this configuration is that the pod will be in pending state. So let's apply it. The deployment was created. And if I initiate the get pod command, uh, I can see that it is in the pending state. Uh, what happened now is the ocean autoscaler react to this requirement and immediately launch a new instance with enough cap capacity uh, to hold this pod. So this is instance is currently uh, being launched and being registered to the cluster. If I'll click here, it will open my AWS console with the specific instance. I can even get uh, to see that the instance was launched and the log detail. And the reason is because I have a deployment of one pod with this amount of vCPU and this amount of memory. And as a result, it launched a C42 Excel uh, containing eight vCPU and uh, 14 gigs of memory. Uh, and again, the autoscaler decided it on its own based on the spot market scoring, based on the spot uh, uh, pricing, durability, and the, requ the requirements of the pod. Uh, I believe it will be soon uh, running on the cluster, so let's see. It's still in pending state. In the meantime, let's cover the next example. The next example will be uh, node affinity. So I have another uh, uh, deployment, but this time I prefer uh, any of these three. I, I have a node affinity with required during scheduling and the instance type I want, I want to, uh, uh, this part to be runner is either of these three, uh, either it's R5, C5, or M589XL. Let's go to the node tab and you can see I don't have this instance type on the cluster. So what I'll expect the autoscaler to do is to launch any of these three uh, to accommodate this pod with uh, uh, taking into consideration any uh, uh, spot market requirement, spot market scoring such as affinity, so such as duration and uh, price and availability. So let's do this in the meantime. You can see that the pod was created. Let's go again. Uh, to the terminal and I can see that the node affinity uh, pod was uh, created. It's in a pending state. In the meantime, the big pod is already running uh, on that specific node. If I go here to the console, I can see uh, that the C42 Excel node 
which was launched uh, uh, two minutes before, before two minutes, uh, uh, already connected. If I click here, I can see that the big pod deployment is running on that specific node. Uh, let's jump to the log again, and what we will able to what we will be able to see here is that <clears throat> because of the node affinity of that specific uh, uh, deployment uh, of that specific pod, sorry, I call the uh, uh, node affinity, the autoscaler react immediately to that specific uh, uh, pod, and it was launched M58 Excel based on the spot availability, uh, which is one of the three instances I declared uh, on my pod stack. So the instance is already running and uh, uh, the node affinity, if I go and hit the, if I get the instance type command, we can see that all the pods that are currently created in a running state, every pod has its own specific uh, uh, node because of the node affinity, because of this requirement. Uh, and if I go to the M58XL instance, I'll be able to see that the node affinity pod is running on this node. This is the, sorry, this is the C42 Excel. Yeah, this is the M58 Excel, and the node affinity is on that specific node. <laughs> Moving forward in our examples, so the next one uh, uh, will be node selector. So I want to select the specific instance type, and this one is a C59 Excel. And again, same goes for here. Let's do apply for that specific uh, uh, pod and sorry, deployment. And as you can see, if I initially get pod command, so again, it is in pending state because what I re required is a C59XL instance, which I don't have currently in the cluster. And again, we can see it in the log tab to fulfill this requirement. The node selector, uh, the restriction was instance type of C59XL. As a result, the autoscale launched a C59XL instance. And in a couple of minutes, it will be bootstrapped to the cluster and we will, and we will be able to see the, the pod in a running state. Uh, the next example will be a pod that run on on-demand instance. So here respondents, we leverage the spot instances to gain a, a significant cost reduction on your cluster, but what if for any reason you need to have your pod running on on demand instance and not suffer from uh, any uh, spot inter in uh, spot interruption <clears throat> for that specific use case we have a unique uh, uh, node selector label which calls podins.io node lifecycle and we immediately identify it if uh, a deployment have its this specific node selector and if so we will launch an on demand instance uh, uh, for the end, label it for that specific deployment. So let's do this again. Let's do apply for the pod on demand. And again, get pod command. And you can see in the meantime that the node selector pod is in a running state because the C59XL instance was already boots up to the cluster. But again, the pod on deployment, the on demand pod is in a pending state. Going back to the log, we can see that the autoscaler uh, uh, catch this event and identify that it needs a node lifecycle on demand. And as a result, moving to the node tab, let's hit the refresh button, we can see that the new instance that was launched right now is an on-demand instance. So let's wait a few minutes. See that it's in a pending state. Let's do the watch command uh, to get this going. Um, in the meantime, I'll, we'll cover the uh, different uh, uh, features and dashboards we have in the platform. So in terms of right sizing recommendation, this is the things that uh, I've talked about earlier. We continuously monitor and track uh, uh, the actual usage of your deployment. And if we identify that it's not the same as the request and we have other recommendation, either we need to downscale or upscale the actual resource request of that specific pod, uh, we give you this recommendation. And based on that recommendation, you can uh, uh, even save even more uh, uh, and be optimized on your cluster. And 
the thing is, it's accessible through API. So we have a lot of customers integrated it with their CI/CD platform. They see that no one uh, uh, define some requests that are not uh, uh, correlated to the actual usage. Going to the cost tab, in the cost we reflect all the namespaces and all the different uh, uh, deployments we had in a specific namespace, break down to the actual cost that the pods that run on that specific deployment was, was cost us. Uh, and again, I can filter it in seven days, 30 days back, I can get even a historic data. So for example, this, this namespace was deleted two days ago and I can get still get their information, it's already tracked. And this is all accessible again through the API uh, uh, with uh, ability to integrate it with any of your reporting uh, uh, services. And let's go back to the notes tab to see if we have the on-demand instance already bootstrapped. Okay, great. So 121, 135, this is the on-demand instance. And immediately I can see that the on-demand deployment is in a running state. Let's do a get node command. And what I want to demonstrate here is this specific node, the on-demand one, we put the unique label of spotins on it in order for the application, for the deployment to be scheduled on this uh, node. So to summarize, we uh, uh, handle all the scaling events in correlate to the different requirements and different CPU and different requests and different affinities that all our deployments have. Uh, we cover how we can uh, uh, give right-sizing recommendation on our application. We see how we can get detailed breakdown of the cost on every namespace and every deployment we have in our cluster, uh, aggregate into uh, days and weeks and month. Uh, this is all, also contain historic uh, 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 data. And of course, we cover how we can run all of this on spot instances while providing up to 90% savings on the uh, cluster cost. So thank again. My name is Tahi Duek. I'm an city architect here at Spotins. Uh, after me, it will be Ram Ribbonzev from Epsigon. Ram, over to you. Thank you very much, Sachi. This was a super enlightening part. In this part, I'm going to talk about tracing microservices on EKS, or in general, how to gain observability into our production workload, which is very distributed today, running on microservices. And again, in this example, it's going to be EKS. I want to start first with talking about what is distributed tracing, because that's the core thing that we need to understand in order to gain a full observability today to our system. And essentially, a trace tells us a story how an event propagates through our system. On the right side, you'll be able to see an example with a client, load balancer, and some different services. And when we want to do distributed tracing in such application, we want to be able to follow a request as it propagates through different services or microservices in my system. In another example that we'll dive into soon, on Jaeger UI, we're able to see exactly how long things take. Every request in my system, even if it's distributed, even if it's running locally, every call that I'm making will be listed. So it makes it much more easier and to understand any performance issues or how long things takes. In real life, distributed tracing is a bit different because our applications are getting much more complex. And there are some scenarios which are hard to track down. For example, in this example that you're seeing, we got Kafka, we got a few Dockers, we got some things on AWS, some third-party APIs. It's getting complex. And you know, between different services, usually you send async or synchronous messages, like for example, message queues or HTTP or gRPC and so on. So it makes it much more harder uh, to troubleshoot or follow from one service to another. And I think it's worth mentioning when you're moving towards cloud and you're leveraging EKS and other container services, there are also some other things that are coming up. For example, managed message queue or managed database or managed web server. All of these are getting you know, some obfuscation to your application, but you still need to be aware of them when you're doing this kind of tracing. 
And distributed tracing is super crucial in nowadays applications because if you see on the example on the left hand side, without distributed tracing, I got so many services talking to one another. But without any distributed tracing, I can't really follow a request. There is only tons of connections between tons of services. But with distributed tracing on the right side, I can easily track down a request of an individual user that is moving from my system. You know, it can be a user that is buying something on my, my website. And I need to track it down and understand why didn't he got his confirmation email. And with that, it really enlightened my path. So first thing is to be able to track down requests from end to end. And also if I would tell you, for example, let's understand how long it takes for a user once he purchase something on our website until you get the confirmation email. So I wanna see where I have any performance bottlenecks or just in general understand how long this kind of things takes in my system. So with distributed tracing, it's possible and it's much more easier to accomplish. Luckily, there is an open source framework called Open Tracing. Open Tracing is a framework or an API that defines how to capture distributed traces. And you can follow that and it's part of the CNCF, the cloud native landscape. Each request or each event that we want to trace down called a span. And when we want to add some information to that span, we're adding context. It's honestly store key value pairs. So for example, I can say that I'm having an event of calling to my database and the key can be like which database uh, server is it and the value would be the host of that database server. Now every span can be related to another span. For example, calling the database is a child of my spring application uh, that I'm getting requests from or the Spring web application is a child of an HTTP call that somebody makes. So it can be a child of or a follows from. Follows from is a more advanced one for uh, sending messages across async events and things like that. Now, one thing to notice, first of all, this is just a framework of how to collect. And then you also need to be aware or implement how to inject and extract trace IDs so you'll be able to correlate between them because you want to correlate between different services that are async to one another. If I'm pushing a message uh, to a message queue and then somebody else consumes it, I want to be able to trace it down from one end to another. After collecting the traces, we need to send them somewhere. So again, another CNCF open source project called Jaeger Tracing. And this allows us to visualize or get and visualize the traces. This open source product built on Go, Elasticsearch, Cassandra, and Kafka, all great open source tools as well. And it shows the data that we just talked about, the spans and context, in a timeline and a waterfall chart, just as we saw in a few previous slides. It does not include any uh, advanced features such as monitoring our environment or sending alerts or collecting the data. It just visualizes the traces, which is good enough, but we might consider something more when we're going to production. Few more uh, notable uh, things in the open source landscape. So Open Census is another open framework uh, that allows us to capture uh, traces because as we mentioned, open tracing just tells us how to collect it, but it doesn't collect uh, the traces themselves. Open Telemetry is the latest CNCF standard that aggregates both open tracing and open census. So it's something that definitely worth following on. And Zipkin or Open Zipkin is another distributed tracing system, pretty similar to Jaeger, but might offer some extra things. Now we talked enough, let's start trace an actual request. And I want to trace down my Spring Web application that is running, you know, some HTTP calls uh, into that. So according to open tracing, what I have to do is pretty simple or not exactly so simple. In order to handle every incoming request to my application, this is an example in Python, I need to inject myself into the handle request, like the, the place where I'm getting the request. I need to activate some context and span to enable my tracer. And then on the before request function, you can see that I'm starting to extract information. For example, uh, extracting the headers and understand whether somebody sent me a different trace ID 
extract the HTTP URL, the remote, the remote IP, and some other context that will allow me to have a better understanding what this pen is all about. And this is just an example of getting an incoming request. This is a never-ending story when you want to trace an instrument, every call in your system. Obviously, our application are not made with HTTP calls only. They're composed with databases, cache, uh, message queues, uh, ma managed cloud resources, and so on. And in some of them, injecting IDs or extracting IDs might be very intrusive. And this is especially going for, you know, uh, S3 objects, Kinesis, and things like that that are managed by the cloud. And also, what about logs or more context? I want to see some data inside my request. This is getting complex and complex. This is, this is a never-ending story that requires both heavy lifting and a constant maintenance across your application. Now, the AppSecond solution really comes to help in this scenario. AppSecond solution is an automated and agentless tracing and monitoring solution. It means that it reduces all the friction uh, of having distributed tracing and collecting these traces and having much more on top of it. And I think that at this point, we're super ready to have some demo time. So this is our demo environment. I want to be able, I want to show you exactly what we're looking at. So this is our architecture for an online store production. This is being deployed on an EKS on top of AWS. And in this one, I'm interested in just, you know, observing my system. So in this kind of application, I'm having a load balancer, specifically calling on slash order endpoint that triggers my Spring Web application running, obviously, on Java on EKS. This Spring Web application just pushing a message to Kafka or producing a message to Kafka and returns a message immediately to the customer, letting him know that his order is being approved and now being handled. And now there is another consumer over here, again running Java on EKS, which updates our item stock on DynamoDB and puts a file for charging the user on our S3 bucket. And then we got another Lambda, Lambda function that charges the user from Stripe. This is our complete application and something first to notice when we want to do observability or part of it is monitoring and metrics is to be able to observe how the system looks like. You know, which resources does it get? How many calls do I'm getting to my Kafka and how long it takes? Or in general to the database, what's going on over there? Is the latency according to what I expect? And what is the error rate? Now, this is one part of observability. Second part is to diving into the metrics. And AppSecond offer built-in metrics into your Kubernetes clusters using Prometheus on our backend. So you don't need to set it up on your own or make sure that it scales according to your scale. You can see nodes, any kind of nodes that you're having, including metrics and data for that specific node. And then you can drill into deployments, containers, and pods. In this example, I'm going to drill exactly into the pods section and I'll be able to see all of my pods and see their status, see their health, see what containers are running on top of it, see how long it was created ago. And then just in general, if I'm interested in diving into a specific one, so this is my stock updater, part of the application that we just saw. And I'm interested in looking in in-depth metrics. So again, with Epsilon, it's super simple. We can see CPU, memory, network, and disk. Now, what I'm really interested in, so I'm having a sort of a problem in the recent uh, period that I'm interested in troubleshooting or looking at the traces that I was just collecting. I'm going to click into that uh, pod and I'll be able to search all traces that are corresponding to this specific pod. Over here, I'll be able to see how many requests I got at the last time frame which I see that I'm getting a lot of errors recently, which is not very good. And as I see, or everybody see, here are all events that are matching to this specific pod. Like somebody clustered for me a way to see all relevant events and traces that are running as part of this pod. Now let's troubleshoot one of them. As you can see, for example, in this Java queuing application, the consumer application, I'm getting some error. So I'm gonna click on this event And what I'll be able to see 
is not only the event itself that I was clicking on, especially this one where it tells me connect timeout exception, fail to connect to hostanalytics.com. I can see, first of all, the all request from one end to another. The incoming request, service A that takes care for the API with the Spring Web application, then a Kafka, then another Kubernetes consumer application, and then rest of my chain of events. Now for this specific selected service, the consumer one, I'll be able to see also exactly where is it running if I got to this searching from a different place. And I wanna trace down and understand what happened before that. So I can see, for example, the request coming from my load balancer. And I can see, for example, the request headers. So this allows me to troubleshoot and understand how it was initiated originally. And also, again, any kind of information about any service, or let's say, for example, I want, I'm interested in looking for the message that was passing in the Kafka uh, topic. So this is the value, this is the exact message. And again, this helps me troubleshoot very easily and understand any context in any distributed application. I can also see that in a timeline view, which helps me understand how long things takes. So the, the producer part was very fast. And then it took a big amount of time until it gets to the consumer. And then it takes awfully lot of time until it gets to my Lambda function as it's being triggered from the S3. So this is tracing. Now, obviously you don't wanna wait in front of the dashboard all day. You wanna get notified when something bad happens. And with notification rules, you can easily get any kind of uh, alert or problem to your application. Epsagon integrates uh, to all most popular uh, frameworks today, Slack, ServiceNow, PagerDuty, and so on. Just quickly to summarize what we, what we saw. So tracing is a crucial part of our modern applications, whether we're running on EKS, ECS, or any other containers and microservices environments, it's crucial to be able to observe our system. There are some existing open source frameworks and tools that helps us to trace and visualize our applications, but we saw that it takes a lot of time and heavy lifting uh, to make it happen. And then there are managed solutions such as Epsagon that can reduce the friction in order to gain observability. Thank you very much.